Welcome to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. This is Pint Glass Football. We talk NFL and college football. I'm your host, Brad Fowler, and McKenzie Brewing is the official beer of Pint Glass Football. Follow them at McKenzie Brewing. Follow us at pintglassfootball.com. If you're new to the show, hit that subscribe button. What's up, PGF Nation? We are back with another great show today. Which loss was more shocking, 49ers or Eagles? NFL and college football takeaways from last week. Plus, we'll preview some big games for NFL Week 7 and Ohio State-Penn State, the big matchup in college football this Saturday, our WTF moments of the week, betting locks of the week, and a lot more to get to. But joining me to break it all down, my co-host, Alex Higdon. Alex, what is going on? A lot of exciting football this weekend on Saturday and Sunday and even Monday with what we saw, some upsets on in the NFL and some great games and upsets on Saturday as well, but some great games between some top teams. Man, it, I, we say this every week, Alex. I swear we say it every week. There's always so many great games, so many great storylines. Like you said, some big upsets we're going to jump into. College football had some big time moments. So much going on, so much to get to. Let's not waste any time. Some NFL news before we get into the games, though, Alex. Colts quarterback Anthony Richardson is probably going to miss the rest of the regular season and could undergo uh, shoulder surgery. Really devastating news, Alex, for a guy that they took fourth overall in April. Now, he had some wow moments this year and was a really an exciting young player to watch. He's a young guy, and I'm sure he's going to bounce back as far as health-wise. I think he's going to be just fine. But we talked last April during the draft process about Anthony Richardson. We loved his talent and the ceiling that he had, the athleticism, but the lack of experience starting that was going to be a big hurdle for him to get over. So losing most of his rookie year, I think definitely hurts his development. Not only hurts his development, but it also hurts the chances that we saw from Indianapolis as they were surging, thought might be a runaway for Jacksonville, but in a weaker division where everybody's with basically within a game of each other and it, you know stalled us out from seeing a lot more of CJ Stroud versus Anthony Richardson being two top draft picks as well. So there's a lot going on. Hopefully he's going to be back and he'll maybe be able to take some mental reps and see what's going on, get in the, get in the playbook, expand his own knowledge of the playbook and come back stronger and better. Yeah, some other injury news, Alex. The Bears are preparing to spend at least next week, maybe longer, without Justin Fields. After the latest injury update that I've been reading here, Alex, Matt Eberflus confirmed on Monday afternoon that Justin Fields is dealing with a dislocated thumb in his right hand and is doubtful to play in their Week 7 home game versus the Raiders on October 22nd. He also added that there is no timetable right now for Fields' return as they continue to gather more information. This is a tough, tough loss here, even if it's going to be short term, because he was starting to play some better ball the last few weeks, and this just feels like a huge make-or-break season for him, so you really hate to see him lose time right now. Absolutely, and I'll talk about this from two different spaces as well. One... He happened to be surging these last two two games and coming into this game with a weak Vikings defense, he might have been able to put together a third game. And that's what we call building confidence to start to get this rolling and perhaps change the narrative that we have. That's the first thing. Actually, I'm going to talk about from three ways. The second thing, if you go back and you watch the play in which he got hurt, this should have never happened. And I've said it time and time again, and, and I will preface this by saying we've talked about Justin Fields getting better making some plays but in this specific play he reverted back to old Justin Fields where he did not see the field this was a play the pocket was clean he had his feet set he saw a play that he wanted to make he pulled it down didn't make a play got away from one defender went to throw the ball again so he had about and I counted it it's about five seconds where he had between him sitting in the pocket and scrambling where he created enough time to either throw the ball away or throw the ball in play. And then he was sacked, landed on the thumb, and there you have the issue there. When you look at the all 22 from the back end zone, 
DJ Moore was wide open and it appears that he looked right at him. He just didn't pull the trigger. So this is a play that should have never happened. He should have just thrown it away or made the play. The third thing for me personally, as a person that has Justin Fields and has Anthony Richardson on his fantasy team, I'm screwed. So <laughs> there's a lot going on. Here. <laughs> Last week, Alex, Thursday night football. Denver, Kansas City. Last week, KC beat Denver. Not surprising. I mean, we we know going into this game, at this point, we already know. Kansas City is good. Denver is bad. We know that. But I want to look more at the macro of this game here because this game made me really believe, Alex, it's officially over for Russell Wilson. Look, I, I haven't been impressed with Sean Payton at all, but I'm starting to really think that it's over for Russell Wilson. I do not think he's going to be on the Broncos next season. And I think his stock has never been lower at any point in his career. So nobody at this point is going to be making a move for him. I think Denver is going to have to go nuclear and just eat the cap hit and move on. And that's going to be really tough for this team to swallow. But I think it just has to be done. And I think they've got to move on and start rebuilding this franchise. I think Seattle at this point has officially pulled off one of the greatest trades ever. And I look at it this way, Alex, if this was a stock, Seattle bought the stock for cheap, right? He was a third round pick. They watched the company take off. And as soon as the company sales dipped just a little bit, they sold that stock for a big price tag to Denver because the Broncos thought they were buying a blue chip stock. But let's face it, Seattle had inside information on this company, and they knew that its best earnings were behind it, and now they're going to have to deal with the consequences. Okay, Brad, everybody, we're going to go to math class for a moment. Put our CEO hats on, and let's be a capologist for a moment. They have a few options here to move on from Rub, so I'm going to agree with you that they're just going to have to blow it up, and by blow it up, it means we're going to have to move on from Russ. So... Here's some of the things that they can do. So if they do a post-June 1 release, that means at the end of this season, they will have to pay Wilson $39 million for 2024. And at the same time, take a $35.4 million cap hit in 2024 and then take a $49.6 million cap hit in 2025 for a total of $124 million to move on from Russ after this season. Now, there's another option. There's a couple other options, but let's just talk about one more. If they decline that option, they would have to take a $53 million dead cap hit in 2024 and then a $32 million cap hit in 2025, which could probably make sense in the long term. And there's other options, but let's just look at those two. Now, depending on what you want to do, because one of the things you have to think about in long term, because if we're saying we're going to blow it up, What does that mean for Patrick Sertain? Is this a person that we want to retain if this is a person we want to keep? Now, depending on what that decision is, so let's just say they want to retain him, how you move on from Russ is going to matter because he's going to reset the market for cornerbacks because of the level that he's out despite what's going on this season. Now, the other thing that works in Denver's favor is they did trade Sean Payton for a number one, they excuse me, they did trade for Sean Payton, but for a number one pick. However, that number one pick has already been used in the 2023 draft. So currently, they are sitting with their own number one in a quarterback rich draft that you'll be able to probably be in a position perhaps to select one of these quarterbacks. So let's take a look at the, let's just run down their list real quick. They're go- coming back to play Green Bay at home, but Green Bay is coming off a bye. Then they go to Kansas City, then a bye week, then they go to Buffalo, at home to Minnesota. Minnesota, let's give them that game. Then they have Cleveland. We'll talk about Cleveland later, but that defense is lights out. Houston, then they're at Houston. Houston's playing well. At the Chargers, anything can happen. At Detroit, Detroit is going to want to win that game because they're playing for the division. New England, let's just say New England's just falling off the map and they're just down. Then they have the Los Angeles Chargers which is a divisional game, another tough game, and then they're at Las Vegas, another divisional game. We could really be looking at this team being 4-13 and 13 by the end of the season, or, you know, 4-13, and 13, and that would definitely put you in the running, I would say, a minimum for a top three pick. Now, depending on how it lines up, 
you're definitely going to be out of the way for Caleb Williams unless the Panthers start to win more. And that's probably going to move you out of Drake May currently where the quarterbacks are slotted. So they're going to have to make some serious decisions. You can blow it up. We just kind of broke down the money of how you can get out from under us. But then you also have to make a decision on your next key player and Patrick Sertain. Are we retaining him or are we willing to trade him and really truly blow this thing up and start from scratch? I would not want to be the GM in Denver. I would not want to be Sean Payton. I wouldn't want to be this capologist. And I would not want to be this owner right now because that is a lot of hard decisions, especially as the owner, after you wrote a big check for Russell Wilson and after you wrote a big check, excuse me, wrote a big check for Russell Wilson and then gave up draft capital to which you alluded to and then also traded for Sean Payton and wrote another check. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of draft stock and stock and draft capital that hit for Seattle that you gave up to now move on from Russ and then now put all your chips in the bag for Sean Payton. That is a tough situation to be in. You bring up Patrick Sertan, one of the best young quarterbacks in the league. You'd love to have a building block like him for the rebuild, but I wouldn't be surprised with the trade deadline coming up if he's on the market. And it would not surprise me at all if they start thinking, look, we're already going to take a huge cap hit getting rid of Russ it's going to make it tough to re-sign guys like him. Let's just move this piece, this asset, and bring in as many draft picks as we can and start really rebuilding this thing from the ground up. And you mentioned it too, with this quarterback draft class, they're going to be in the mix. They are headed for a top five pick in a hurry. I don't think there's any doubt. You laid it out with the schedule. There's not a lot of W's on that schedule. So this team is going to be in the mix for one of these young quarterbacks, and there's no way they're going to want to keep Russell around with that big price tag and then having this young quarterback sitting behind him. And then that whole situation just gets really toxic. So I think we're headed in this direction, and this has been the most fascinating bad team in the NFL. There's no doubt about it. We talk about them every week, it seems like. But look, this is going to get ugly. We knew it was going to get ugly, and now here it is. Alex, the Twitter poll question of the week. At PGF Podcast on Twitter. If you're not following, give us a follow, guys. Love to do these poll questions and get the reactions from PGF Nation. What outcome was more shocking? Jets 20, Eagles 14, or Browns 19, 49ers 17? These were two big upsets last week. Let's dive into these games, Alex. I'm going to start, though, by asking you, what outcome was more shocking to you? It was definitely the Eagles game. Did not expect the Eagles to look the way that they did. I knew it would be tough. However, with DJ Reed as well as Sauce Gardner out, I expected the Eagles to pull this out. But the fortitude and the tough coaching and the toughness of the Jets to get them the win. I mean, key turnovers. At some point, we're going to have to talk about, you know, Jalen Hurts, which I had not thought about until it was brought up to me that he has seven touchdowns and I believe seven interceptions, which I but if I'm not mistaken, puts him in the league, excuse me, in the lead for the most turnovers this year. And if we look at Jalen Hurts last year in terms of what that team was doing, he only had, if I'm not mistaken, he only had six interceptions all year. And I believe the fifth, I know he didn't play the whole season, but 15 to 16 games. And we're only six weeks in and he already has seven, seven TDs, seven interceptions. And I believe he's leading the league in turnovers in total. If not, he's near the top. So this offense isn't looking as fluid as it is. And we always talk about this, Brad, when you lose coordinators, even though their coach is an offensive coach, losing both coordinators is not always as easy to come right in and just keep the ball rolling. The running game had like a hot streak for maybe two games, but then it slowed down a little bit. And I know a lot of the Philly fans didn't like Miles Sanders. However, he had been kind of consistent. And I know they have some injuries now. Lane John, Iron Man Lane Johnson, I believe, has a injury that he is dealing with. So he's been a little, he hasn't been as strong. The other thing is, and we'll watch and see, uh, we know that they added Julio Jones recently. But the other thing that's interesting, they lost Javon Hargrave. I believe Josh Sweat, they lost Josh Sweat as well. They, you know, Linval Joseph and and Sue as well. So that's four people that were initially in that rotation that kept a lot of those guys fresh. 
to continuously keep the pressure on with the rotation. They had to have fresh legs at all times. And now you don't have that great rotation. And you Jordan Davis has to play a little bit more. And as we said before him coming out, he's you know not accustomed to playing all those snaps, but he'll have to work in his shape. Same thing with Jalen Carter. They let go of TJ Edwards and the linebacking core. Nicole Dean, I believe, has been hurt a little bit and maybe not been living up to what the hype that, I don't want to say the hype, but is to what they thought when they let some of the other linebackers go. So I think there's a lot of things that are just catching up with the Eagles at one time. I know we both said we didn't think they played their have played their best football yet, and I know a couple of fans have said that as well. From a bye week, they face Kansas City, the Bills, the Niners, the Cowboys, and the Seahawks. Those next excuse me, eight weeks are going to be very tough. So that bye week, they're going to have to consider a lot of things and fix a lot of things, perhaps bring some other people in because coming back out of that bye week in week 10, after facing the Cowboys, Kansas City, Buffalo, San Francisco, and Dallas and Seattle, that is really going to be a, tell- a telltale of where they'll be and if they can hold on to stay in- at the top of that division, that division or if the Cowboys can overtake them, which we'll talk about the Cowboys later. But I think there's a lot to talk about with Philly as now they start to get into the meat of their schedule. Whether it's radio shows, podcasts, I I hear a lot of people kind of freaking out about these losses. I'm not going to overreact because both these games were low scoring defensive battles. These are the kind of losses that happen even to really good teams. Now let's start with the Eagles because you mentioned them. Eagles lost because the Jets were able to force four turnovers and really shut down that Eagles offense for much of the game. They picked off Jalen Hurts three times. You mentioned the turnovers that he's had this year. Now, Hurts had 45 passing attempts in this game. And I've said before how much he's improved as a passer, but him throwing 45 times is not a recipe for success for Philly. I talked about their identity last week, winning in the trenches, that power run game, and the Jets won the battle up front in this one. And Look, I rarely brag about my bets, but I was not surprised at all about this outcome. I took the Jets plus the points and the money line. I was that confident about this game. I had this game circled. This felt like an L all the way. And the main reason why is because I knew that Jets defense could match up. And let's face it, styles make fights. This was a matchup that I knew was going to be really tough for the Eagles because of how good the Jets are, especially in that front seven. And they caused a lot of problems for this offense. They created turnovers. And on a side note here, Zach Wilson, he's put together some good games here. Not great, but he's looked a lot better. It looks like he's improving here after taking back that starting role. And when he takes care of the ball, this defense and the run game, they're good enough for this team to win games. I want to jump to the 49ers though for a second. 49ers in this game, they lose Christian McCaffrey, who we talked about, would be the MVP for us at this point in the year. Debo Samuel, who's a Swiss Army knife and just does so many things in that offense. It opens up the playbook so much. Really, both those guys open up the playbook so much for what Kyle Shanahan likes to do. You lose those two guys, and it's going to make things tough. On top of that, they lose Trent Williams, Arguably the top left tackle in the game. You could certainly put him in the discussion as one of the very best left tackles in the game. I think he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. You lose all those three guys, you're talking about three of maybe your top five players on offense. So, of course, this is going to be tough on the road versus one of the best defenses in the NFL. That Browns defense is for real. I don't think anybody added more value to a team this offseason than Jim Schwartz has for that Browns defense. And we did not talk about this move enough in the offseason. It was really an under-the-radar move. But, man, what he has done for that group has really been impressive. And if you look at the past, he's had success versus Kyle Shanahan. And they were able to put pressure on Brock Purdy. Like I said, with some of his go-to guys out, that made it difficult as well. Here's another note, and I hate doing this, but it was so obvious to me, and it's really been all over the Internet. The refs had two terrible and I mean terrible calls on the 49ers in that Cleveland game on the go-ahead fourth quarter drive that allowed Cleveland to take the lead late in that game. I mean, those were brutal. I don't know how you make either one of those calls. Now, Brock Purdy wasn't great in this game, but I was really impressed, Alex, in late in this game because he came up big late, leading the 49ers down the field late for a potential game-winning field goal. Their rookie third-round pick 
of a kicker missed a 41 yarder. Man, that that stings. When you take a rookie in the third round, he better be automatic. That's that's tough to see a guy miss a big kick like that, especially from such a makeable range. Absolutely. To some quick notes on Cleveland, and I'll start with them first to be fair to them. And I understand all the injuries that happened to the 49ers. But the Cleveland Browns literally have been shutting everyone down defensively. This is what they have been doing. This is six weeks into the season, and they have now, just now, given up a thousand yards of total offense. They're at a thousand two. So that just happened with this game. They only allow 121 yards passing, and they only allow 79 yards rushing and 15.4 points a game. This defense is playing at a, probably the, the greatest that a Cleveland Browns defense has probably played in the modern era. And one of the things, to your point, talking about what Jim Schwartz did, there's a guy that I had fallen in love with about maybe, I guess, three years ago when he was coming out of Notre Dame. Uh, JOK, Jeremiah Wusu Karamoa. I thought this guy was an animal and I wanted him to be drafted by my team. The Raiders obviously they didn't, but I think Jim Schwartz has now given him the freedom to use his speed, to use his instincts, and is turning him loose. And I think we're seeing him reap the benefits. I mean, we're only five games in. He already has eight tackles for loss. So that tells you this guy is instinctive. He's rushing the holes with that wide nine technique. He can see what's in front of him and shooting forward and doing what needs to be done. And he already has a sack after having none last year. So I like the leap that I'm seeing from him because I always thought he was going to be a good player. But to your point, again, everything that you said about what Jim Schwartz has done to this defense and how they are looking. And even when Trent Williams was in the game, we all saw that play with Miles Garrett with one arm lift Trent Williams off his feet and that is a big man that is not a man to be taken lightly but his strength and his bull rush he lifted Trent Williams to get to the quarterback although I believe that might have been after he got hurt and he tried to keep going but still Trent Williams at 85 percent is better than probably 95 percent of the league either way and to your point with everything that went on with San Francisco the fortitude to still fight through and go through everything they went through to still have a shot and that kicker that they drafted. And when you draft a kick in the third round, you are usually expecting him to make that, I don't want to call it a chip shot, but that 41-yard field goal. And over the past, I think if I'm not mistaken, the stat that I saw was throughout the entire history of the NFL, that is an 81% chance of hitting that field goal. And that's kind of high in terms of the situation. So I believe that even though everything they went through, we saw Brock Purdy be able to lead them down the field. I also think that Brandon Ayuk had a bad drop in this game as well. Overall, I think Cleveland really out physicaled the Niners at the point of attack, especially when you look at the rushing. 34 times, 160 yards at 4.7 a clip. And that's not what the 49ers usually do up front. It's also facing the third string backup in PJ Walker. And at some point, and I may have said it last week, but at some point again, we're going to have to talk about Deshaun Watson and what's going on with him and how this team is supposed to be led by him and what's going on internally. Cause I think something's going to brew because that defense is playing at a level and the guy that they have and paid a lot of money to is not on the field. Alex commanders Falcons. This was kind of an under the radar game here. Atlanta really outplayed the commanders in almost every statistical category in this game. But Washington was able to force three big turnovers. All three were second half interceptions from Desmond Ritter. Now there is no doubt in my mind, no matter what the record that the Falcons finished with, they've seen enough of Ritter. And I think they're going to draft a quarterback in April or certainly make a move to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one good thing, and it's really for fantasy owners, we saw Drake London finally have a good game and and Kyle Pitts get into the end zone. Other than that, when Desmond Ritter's thrown 47 times, you're not having a good game. Sunday night football, Bills-Giants. On paper, this did not look like a good matchup. Bills were obviously a heavy favorite at home, and this ended up being a really entertaining game. Giants nearly steal one, coming within one yard of upsetting the Bills on the road. Giants, look, their defense played really tough versus a much more talented Bills team. This was a roster mismatch, and I've got to give some credit to Wink Martindale because I thought he had a great game plan for the Bills, and it really kept them in this game. 
Tyrod Taylor came in, played for Daniel Jones, who was injured. I thought he played a pretty good game for the most part, especially in that situation going up against a good Bills defense. I know the Bills have lost some key players, but that's still a pretty good team he was going against. The only huge mistake here was checking into a run play near the goal line with only a few seconds left. In that situation, they've got no timeouts. Checking into a run play with no timeouts in that situation is really inexcusable, even for a backup quarterback. This is a veteran NFL quarterback. You can't make that kind of mistake. Brian Dayball lost his mind after that play, and and I get it. This is a close game. They were fighting hard to be in this game. They had the lead. They could have extended the lead there. They should have had at least one shot to the end zone. Like I said, come away with at least three points. To come up empty in that spot was awful. And what makes it worse, late in the game, Tyrod Taylor leads a really nice 12-play drive after the Bills missed a field goal and gets them down to the one-yard line. In a situation where, looking back, if they had those three points, they would have been in a position to kick a field goal and win the game instead of needing a touchdown. They end up running a play-action pass at the goal line that fell incomplete. And it's something I'll admit, I didn't see it. I didn't notice it, I should say, as much live. But looking back on this game and watching the replays, man, the refs missed a blatant two-handed grab and hold on Darren Waller. I mean, this was a obvious pass interference that they really missed on. The Bills, you know, they, they squeak by with a win here, Alex. This is a team as talented as they are. They just seem to play to the level of their competition. Their inconsistency has to be frustrating for Bills fans. A lot of things to unpack here, Alex, but what are your thoughts on this game? That the Bill, excuse me, that the Giants are supposed to help my prediction of the Bills not making the playoffs come true and they failed. However, <laughs> you know, I'll, 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 start, I'll, start, I'll start with the Bills first. Josh Allen, there are other receivers on the field besides Stephon Diggs. One, I'm not sure what's going on with Dalton Kincaid. This was considered the best tight end coming out in the draft, and I don't even see him with a target or even any time on the field or a target or anything. If you use draft capital that high on a tight end, this guy should be getting other targets because this was the narrative coming into the season. It's Stephon Diggs. They don't have a run game. They need more help. Well, you went and got more help, and what's happening? Josh Allen threw the ball 30 times. Stefan Diggs had 16 targets. That's more than half of the attempts of Josh Allen. That does not bode well. Ken Dorsey, I'm looking at you. I think there needs to be a little bit more balance. James Cook had 14 carries for 71 yards at 5.1 yards a clip. So this was a person that was effectively running the ball. And it seems that you went away from him. You had a healthy balance between him and Murray. You should have continued that since that was being successful, since it appeared that the Giants were intent on not allowing you to throw the ball. Now onto the Giants. Tyrod Taylor looked more decisive in getting that ball out. And I know Saquon Barkley was back. He did have 93 yards on 24 carries. However, one of those runs was for 34 yards. So he actually had 23 carries for 59 yards at 2.5 yards on average with the exception of that one long run. The last thing about the Giants, that play at the goal line, when you have a chance to win the game, that cannot be the best play that you had in your repertoire to pull out. Everybody in the stadium knew your number one weapon in terms of throwing the ball, that you weren't going to run it, that you are going to throw the ball because you couldn't waste any time doing that. You had to throw the ball into the end zone. It was going to be Darren Waller. I don't think that was the right play. I mean, easily I said, oh, they're going to use Waller as a decoy and they're going to slip some type of backup tight end out somewhere and get an easy touchdown. We've seen it 10 million times. I did not like that play call at that point, and I thought that Dayball did a disservice. Yes, it was a pass interference. However, you don't put the ball, the, the game in the ref's hands, but I do understand that. I'm not denying that it didn't happen. However, I just felt they could have called a better play at that point in time, and they didn't. Monday Night Football, Alex. Chargers, Cowboys. This was a big-time matchup here, AFC, NFC matchup. Cowboys bounce back, get a big win after that blowout loss last week to the 49ers. It felt like they needed this win. It felt like they really needed to get back on track here. 
not surprising. Usually after a team gets really blown out and embarrassed, you usually see a really great effort for them. This ended up being a pretty entertaining game. Chargers lose by three. And once again, Brandon Staley, my gosh, this guy. It's funny, Alex, you had texted me when this game was live, and we were both thinking the same thing. Like, what are you doing here? Going for it on fourth down in a tight game when three points would have been huge. I mean, look, they lose the game by three. So once again, you look back on these decisions and you've got a head coach that's really hurting his own team here. Now, not to take anything away from the Cowboys because they they played really well in this game. Dak had one of his better games of the year, but not surprising. I mean, in reality, it's not surprising because it seems like every quarterback has a good game versus Brandon Staley's defense. Now, the Cowboys defense, on the other hand, was suffocating up front. I mean, they completely shut down the run game. The Chargers could get nothing going on the ground, and it really put a lot of pressure on Herbert because once the Cowboys realized, like, look, these guys can't run the ball, they started getting consistent pressure on Herbert, five sacks, six quarterback hits, a ton of quarterback pressures. I mean, he was under duress for most of this game, and it really knocked him out of a rhythm. This is probably one of the worst games he's played all year. He missed on some throws. He had some moments where he could have made throws he didn't make, certainly. But I think the pressure was certainly getting to him in this game. Dallas, that defense, I, I thought they did a really terrific job in this game because Cowboys offense wasn't exactly lighting it up. And I feel like the Cowboys defense really did a lot in this win. Now, Dallas is still probably... I don't think a whole lot's changed. I think they're about a top four team or so in the NFC. But Alex, as far as me, this win doesn't really change at all how I feel about them as a legit contender when we're looking at the big picture. I actually thought both teams' defenses played very well. This looked like an old school black and blue game. Like when you saw how hard hitting they were, I mean, you could hear the pads hitting each other. I said, this is, I actually texted when I said, this is going to be an ice up. This is going to be an ice bath game because they were out there flying all over the field, especially early on, trying to dislodge the ball, trying to take a person off of their feet. So I will actually give a little bit of pushback there to Brandon Staley's defense because they also did sack Dak Prescott five times as well. But I felt there was a lot of hard hitting and then this team, this was a very well played game defensively. Justin Herbert. I don't know what's going on with Justin Herbert, but in this game, he missed three key throws, one to Palmer and two to Keenan Allen. And I mean, Keenan Allen was wide open on the sideline and it wasn't overthrown. It wasn't too high. It was badly overthrown where he didn't even have a chance to make a play on it. However, as we always say, and as I'm looking at my Madden game paused on my TV, Brandon Staley continues to play Madden with this multi-talented team. And I do not know why, you know, but also Dallas also went for it on the fourth down as well. However, when you're looking at how this game is being played, how defense, how defensively these guys out here hard hitting points are now at a premium. You cannot take you have to read the room or in this case, read the game and say, listen, this is not going to go well. Like we're going to have to take points wherever we can get points because Neither one, our defense isn't giving up much, and neither is their defense giving up much. But as usual, Brandon Staley apparently wanting to get fired, especially when the Raiders have a better, when I have a better uh, record than you, you want to get fired with the type of team that you have, with the type of quarterback that you have, with the type of weapons that you have on offense and defense. You should not be a two and three team, let alone also one and two at home. So, Brandon Staley, your days are numbered. On to Dallas. I actually want to say I thought Dak looked very good in this game, and this was a tough game to play. Getting outside the pocket, consistently making plays, using his leg, using his legs as well. When Tony Pollard, who basically got shut down on the run himself, only 15 carries for 30 yards, he couldn't run as either. This was a Dak press. This was really on Dak Prescott's legs and arms to do anything to be do. Great throw on the wheel route to Tony Pollard. He just can hang on. There was also another great deep route that he threw to Michael Gallup that hit him right in the hands. That's so that's two touchdowns that they could not that they did not complete where this game would not have been close at all. That Dak did his job. But 
Tough catch for Tony Pollard, but once, as they say, once you put your hands on it, you got to bring it in. And then Michael Gallup, that is a flat-out drop in the end zone when you bust the seam open and Dak Prescott hits you in stride and you laid out for it and you just simply dropped the ball. But I thought this was a well-played game defensively and actually probably the best game Dak has played this year where he looked like a guy that could lead a team to the Super Bowl. All right, let's wrap up NFL Week 6, Alex, with the NFL Week 6 game ball. I'll kick this one off, Alex. I'm going to take Rams wide receiver Cooper Cup. Coming back from the injury here, starting to really get back into rhythm. Seven catches, 148 yards. But on top of that, 21.1 yards per catch. I mean, this guy was a big-time target down the field, making huge plays. He caught a touchdown in this game as well. He had an awesome catch on the sideline, toe tap to get both beat down. He's dealt with some injuries. He's had a little trouble staying healthy, especially in recent years. But when this guy is healthy and on the field, he is a dominant player. Yeah, Cooper Cup, I mean, came back and picked up like he never left. I mean... This guy is the real deal. We have There's always a narrative about he only plays the slot. We have to stop that. A lot of your favorite receivers play in the slot. If you saw last night's game, CeeDee Lamb couldn't get open on the outside. It wasn't until they moved into the slot is when he started to take off. He's the real deal. It's time to stop the narratives, the white wide receiver and so on and so forth. He's just who he is, and he's damn good. So kudos to Cooper Cup. I'm actually going to go with a unit. Brad, and we, I, I mentioned this to you, and as you know, my Raiders are my Raiders, but I have to give them some respect because bef- prior to this game, I had not noticed that the Raiders were a top 10 defense. So I want to give them some love, and being that I've probably never seen this since, in, in, since I've been alive, that they've been this good, they've been smothering teams. I have I don't know when's the last time I've seen this balance of a defense from the Raiders. And although it was the struggling Patriots, we are also struggling as well on offense, but they were still able to hold on and do some things. So I want to give some kudos and some love to the Raiders. As a lot of people say, I'm always down on my own teams, but I do want to show them some love because that's something I did not expect. Zencaster is the ultimate web-based podcasting solution. It provides high-quality audio and video podcast production and hosting. With a full suite of professional tools, podcasters can seamlessly record, produce, and publish studio-quality content all from one dashboard. Zencaster's post-production process takes the headache out of audio production. Set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing background noise with a click of a button. Coordinating all your guests to record in person is painful and tedious. Easily invite up to 11 participants per recording with one click. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code PGFP and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Hey there, PGF Nation. You know what's important when you're having a good time? Staying hydrated. And that's where Liquid IV comes in, the category-winning hydration brand that's fueling your well-being. With just one stick of Liquid IV, you get two times faster hydration than water alone, plus five essential vitamins to keep you feeling your best. And let's not forget about the convenience factor. The packaging is perfect for on the go, whether you're tailgating or just hanging out on the couch. But what really sets Liquid IV apart is the amazing flavors. Personally, I'm all about the Concord Grape and Lemon Lime. And with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks, Liquid IV is made with premium ingredients to give you the hydration and nourishment you need. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code PGFP at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code PGFP at liquidiv.com. So next time you're cracking open a cold one and settling in for the big game, make sure you've got Liquid IV by your side. Trust me, your body will thank you. 
NFL Week 7 games. We're going to preview and kind of look ahead at some of these games. Get your thoughts here to start this off, Alex. NFC South matchup. Buccaneers-Falcons. A little bit under the radar game, but I think this could be a good one. What are you circling in this matchup? Well, I'm going to be circling that Buccaneers defensive line to see because I think, you know, even though they had a weak game this last game, but Bijan and Tyler Algiers, I'm, they, they need to have another breakout game. And I think this could be right for them to have that breakout game because this is an interdivisional, excuse me, a divisional game. And it could also put them in the driver's seat to be tied for first place which we knew this deep, we will, at least this podcast, didn't think anybody was going to run away with this division like most of you Saints uh, supporters. However, we're, I'm looking at that being a big game because the Buccaneers are still currently sitting in first place just based upon they had a bye week. But I'm looking at the, that Buccaneers defensive line to see if they can shut down that running game because I don't think that Arthur Smith is ever going to allow Desmond Ritter to throw the ball 47 times again. So I think... Get ready for a black and blue game because they're just going to load up and I think they're going to run for maybe 35 to 40 times a game to see what they can do if they can score on the Buccaneers. But I will say that over under 38 and Tampa Bay at home is giving up two and a half points for you betting guys out there. Yeah, I like the Bucks in this matchup, and I like the under. I'm with you. I think this is going to be a low-scoring game. There's going to be a lot of running the football, a lot of smash-mouth football, a lot more field goals than touchdowns in this one to bounce back in this game. Dolphins-Eagles, huge matchup. AFC East, NFC East matchup here. Alex, I'm going to save my take on this one for later in the show, but what are you looking for in this game? What I'm looking for in this game now, this is a home game for the Eagles, I'm actually looking at the Dolphins to see if they can go into a hostile, and we know how those Philly fans can be, into a hostile environment without a running game. Unfortunately, Devin A. Chain is out right now, but into a hostile game and see what they can do. They're also missing Teron Armstead. So this is an opportunity for that Eagles defense to get back on track and cause some havoc back there for Tua and not be able to have Tyreek and Jalen Waddle running wild in that backfield. So I'm actually looking at the Eagles here to see if that defensive line can create a lot of pressure and get Tua off his mark where this is a close game and see what they can do in terms of pulling it out. But I'm looking at you, the Dolphins, to see if you are prepared to go into hostile territory and handle business. Ravens, Lions, this is an interesting game, Alex. The Ravens have been as good as, well, maybe as good or if not better than anybody in the league this year against the pass. That's going to be an interesting matchup here because we know that Jared Goff and this Lions team is really built around the passing game. They love to throw the ball. They do it really well. They're a passing-based offense. But they've got big problems with the running back position right now. So I think a lack of balance in this offense versus this Ravens team could be problems because of some of the injuries they have in that backfield. So I think the key to this game here is really going to be that Ravens defense and that secondary I like this matchup here for the Ravens, Alex, and I especially like what I've seen from Lamar Jackson. He's playing really good football. I think he's flying a little bit under the radar right now nationally and maybe not getting the credit he deserves because I like what I've seen from him, how this offense is evolving now in the passing attack with Todd Munkin pulling the strings. First thing I want to point out is the Lions for as Great as they were on offense and as bad as they were on defense, the Lions are currently a top 10 defense, and they're only allowing 65 yards rushing. So they're actually really, really good against the run and middle of the road against the pass. So now I'm looking to see again, Lions, this is a big game for you. This is a prove game because this doesn't stop what the Lions are doing in their own division and within the conference of the NFC. But this is this is a litmus test for the Lions because this is a big game. You're also going into hostile territory as well. Now, I have very mixed feelings about Lamar. I'm looking at Lamar. He's doing some of the things that I said he wasn't doing. He's letting the ball go. He's trying to trust his receivers. We know there's been some drops, primarily in that Pittsburgh game, but it hasn't been as widespread as a lot of people like to allude to. It's really just that one game where it was just awful all around. I don't know if that offense is really looking as well as it should. And that's just my perspective. I don't I don't know what the Ravens are because I feel like 
the Bengals are going into a bye, and they're going to come back, and they're just going to come roaring back. And if the Steelers can figure out anything, I don't know where the Ravens stand in this because they don't look dominant in anything on offense. Defense is playing well, but we always get a great Ravens defense. I don't know. This is going to be interesting, and I'm really going to watch the Ravens and what the Ravens can do against the Lions offensively and defensively. I know that I believe Montgomery is going to be out things there, but we're going to have to wait and see what's going on with the Ravens offensively because it's very inconsistent. Lamar does look better, but I don't know if he is better. It's just really interesting watching this all unfold. Alex, Ravens are a three-point favorite. Who do you like in this matchup? I actually like the Ravens in this matchup. I think Lamar in terms of what he's doing, and I did give a little bit of pushback, but, you know, still kudos to what I'm seeing, especially with him being able to see the entire field and go through the reads. That's one of the key things I look at in any quarterback to see, young, old, to see if they're seeing the whole field. He is seeing the entire field, and maybe we're just a year too early, or my, my expectation is a year too early, and next year this this offense is going to explode but he is definitely a better quarterback from any type of criticism that I've given him. And I think that's going to be the key factor in them winning and them beating the Lions on Sunday. I like Baltimore and laying the three as far as betting goes. Saints, Jaguars. Saints are a slight home favorite in this one, Alex. I like them in this spot. Jags, I think, are due for a letdown game here. On the road, tough defense. Loud Saints home crowd. It's always been a tough place to play. And and look, the Saints aren't losing because of their defense. That defense is still playing at a pretty high level. It's because of Derek Carr and the offensive play calling. It, it just has not clicked. It hasn't worked. It's really one of the main reasons that I wasn't very high on them in this offseason. I know you weren't very high on the Saints either. It, it, we both kind of punted on this team. We, we thought they'd be a lot closer to average than what a lot of other media and podcasters were saying about this team. But coming off of another loss, this is a desperate football team at home, Thursday night game, short week. So tough road game here for the Jaguars. I already bet this game. I'm feeling pretty good about it. I took Saints muddy line. I think they get after Trevor Lawrence if he plays. That's a whole nother side note here. There's a possibility that Lawrence isn't available. But even if Trevor's the guy under center, I still like the Saints in this spot, Alex. What do you think? Yeah, the Saints need to get off the snide. I mean, if Trevor's not playing, which I will say in terms of pushback, if Trevor's playing, I'm going to take the Jaguars. But obviously, if he's not, then I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go with the Jags. I just think they're trying to get back on track. The Saints are a little susceptible to the run, and if you can put Tank Bigsby and you give me Travis Etienne back there, there's a lot of things that they can do. And even though New Orleans is doing very well against the pass, one of the things that I would need to point out, and we talked about it during the draft, where they are weak at, they can't cover tight ends. Evan Ingram and the rookie out of Penn State, Brandon Strait, should be heavily used from a scheme standpoint. Doug Peterson you know how to do this. You are a, you are a product of Andy Reid. Exploit the weakness, and you don't have to go crazy with Ridley and Kirk. Use the tight ends. Use your running game, and you can win this game. Alex, there's always a player, a coach, a team, a ref, somebody that makes us say, what in the WTF are they doing? Oh, Alex, who is going to be the WTF moment of the week for you? Mine has to go to the New York Giants and Brian Dayball. I know he was yelling at Tyrod Taylor, but we never know. We always talk about preparedness. And I don't know what was said to him on the sideline going into onto the field. If somebody said, well, maybe somebody in his helmet said something or what was going on there. But that was a complete debacle all across the board the end of half play and then i'm sorry i'm still going to go to that last play offensive set that they had at the goal line i did not like that play i thought they should have been more creative and just simply putting one receiver out there to go understood understandably that that was clearly pass interference but i just thought they should have been more creative i think the giants blew a chance after playing one of their probably their best game defensively 
in terms of beating one of the top teams in the league. So sorry, Giants and Dayball. You guys get my WTF of the week. Oregon Ducks head coach Dan Lanning. Now, look, I'm not saying analytics don't have a place in football, but at this point, I just think they're being way overused. Analytics and always being aggressive and going for it on fourth down instead of kicking a chip shot field goal, it's nonsense. I don't care what the analytics tell you because in a back and forth, close game, in a big time matchup, don't beat yourself. Make the other team beat you. And that's why I have such an issue with all these coaches continuing to go for it in these situations. Let's break it down real quick. The first one, at the end of the first half, they're trailing 22 to 18. Fourth and three on the Washington three-yard line. You're going to get the ball to start the second half. You just picked off Michael Penix, who, by the way, doesn't throw that many picks. You need to take advantage of that gift and kick the field goal. It would cut the lead to one point, and then you get the ball to start the second half, and you have all the momentum. Instead of going into the half being down just one, now your team goes in deflated. Then in the third quarter, they go for it again. They don't make it. Once again, another easy chip shot field goal. And then, of course, the big one that everyone's talking about, fourth and three from their own 47-yard line with two minutes and 16 seconds left to play. Look, I can understand there's some reluctance giving Michael Penix another chance. You're trying to be aggressive, go for the win. I get it, but you got to think about it situationally because your defense stopped them the last three possessions. Your defense was playing great. At that point in the game, they had really stepped up. They were putting a ton of pressure on Michael Penix. If you punt the ball in that situation, make them go 80 or more yards with no timeouts under two minutes to play. And after that play, if you watch the sideline, watch the Ducks after that play, watch the coaches have everything. The energy is drained from the Oregon sideline after that play. And it's not surprising that two plays later, Washington scores easily. All of a sudden, you're behind. The momentum that you give another team when you go for it and you turn it over on downs in a situation like that, in a big game, you just give the other team life. And this is the part that analytics doesn't get the emotion of the game, the momentum of the game. Now the other team is fired up. Oregon lost the Washington game this way last year by going for it on fourth and one from their own 33 yard line in a tied game and giving Washington a field goal to win the game. Lanning, look, at this point, look, he's done a really good job at Oregon. He's got this program playing at a high level, but that's two straight years where they've lost big games to a rival team with his bad fourth down decisions. College football week seven, some big time matchups, some big time games. But I want to start here, Alex. Jimbo Fisher, the contract that Jimbo Fisher signed with Texas A&M is now becoming one of the worst deals in all of sports. I mean, this has really backfired in their face. The Aggies are now 0-8 against ranked SEC teams on the road under Jimbo Fisher after losing to Tennessee last week. I It got me thinking about this big contract because, let's face it, that huge contract is the only reason that this guy is still coaching. So I dug into the numbers, Alex. What would Texas A&M owe Fisher if they decided to move on from him during or after the 2023 college football season? It's a 10-year deal, $94.95 million, and every dollar is guaranteed. Brutal that they're in this situation with a coach that has this program going nowhere. 2018, Aggies went 9-4 and four overall. 2019, 8-5 and five overall. 2020, the COVID year, They go 9-1 and overall. They extend his contract and make it even bigger. Then 2021, 8-4 overall. 2022, 5-7 overall. You can kind of see the trend here, guys. 2023 right now, 4-3 currently, 2-2 in the SEC. This has become a total failure. They are not getting the kind of returns that they expected when they took or when they signed this guy from Florida State. Okay, Brad. So you talked about Jimbo Fisher and you went down and you and you ran down his record as a coach since he went to Texas A&M. 
Let's also turn and look at his recruiting. 2018, we'll give some grades to the first year there. 2019, number four, they were fourth overall in terms of their incoming class. 2020, sixth in the incoming class. 21, eighth in the incoming class. 22, number one in the country for incoming class. So that is, excuse me, four top 10 classes that you brought in, and that was 2023. So that means... From 19, 20, and 21, some of those senior, juniors might have graduated, excuse me, moved on and gone to the NFL. And perhaps maybe you lost them to the transfer portal, but you were fourth, sixth, and eighth from 19, 20, 21. Those guys are now either juniors or seniors, and you still are struggling. This seat is getting warmer and warmer, not for him, but for Dion. Let's, let's, let's keep watch. Oh, man. That is interesting, Alex. Let's let's jump into Deion Sanders here because Deion Sanders has been at the center of the college football universe this year. A game that most of you, most of you probably didn't see live, Colorado-Stanford, Alex, because side note here, this game kicked off at 8 p.m. local time in Colorado. Deion Sanders said the 8 p.m. kickoff was the, quote, dumbest thing ever. And, quote, the stupidest thing ever invented in life. Who wants to stay up till 8 o'clock for a darn game? Thank God we're not going to be in this conference. And Alex, he's right. And I said it when the Pac-12 was falling apart because of realignment over the summer. One of the things that has killed this conference for years was exposure. And he's absolutely right. Playing these late night games is just stupid. Nobody sees these games, especially on the East Coast. So I have no problem with what he said there. They've had some ups and downs this year. I mean, most expected that. I think year one, taking over a new program. But there's no denying that they've been an exciting team to watch. Knocking off then number 17 TCU, the overtime thriller versus Colorado State, that huge comeback that came up just short versus USC. But now an epic collapse versus Stanford last Friday night after trailing By 29 points, Stanford would go on to score 26 unanswered points, force overtime, pull off the win. The comeback marked the largest comeback in Stanford history, the fourth largest in Pac-12 history, and saw Stanford come back from what was the largest halftime deficit in Pac-12 history as well. Here's the bottom line. This is a really bad loss versus a bad Stanford team that well, quite frankly, lost to Sacramento State this year. So from a talent standpoint, you've got to beat these guys. You cannot lose this game if you're Colorado. They acted like it was over at halftime. And what's really disappointing for Colorado here is I think there's a good chance that this loss could keep them from reaching a bowl game this year. Now, I'm still very impressed with what Dion is doing and what he's building there in Colorado. I don't think anybody expected him to even have the level of success that he's had already. I think this program is moving in the right direction, and they're really going to be a fun watch next year. I'm going to throw out some numbers. 15, 207 yards, and one touchdown. That was the stat line for Elek Amamenor, the wide receiver, coming in to the Colorado game. When he entered that game, he had 13 catches, 294 yards and three touchdowns. So he literally captured what he had done for the first five weeks of college football. He topped it in one game. Now, I like Dion. I love what he's doing. And I understand this is his first foray into a bigger conference, a lot more lights, you know, a lot bigger lights in terms of what he may have been doing at Jackson State and what he did with an incredible job. And he's continuing to do an incredible job here as well. And I'm sure he'll learn from this as he moves forward in coaching. But the inability from either him to and to communicate to the defensive coordinator or the defensive coordinator to make the adjustment to not have Travis Hunter on this gentleman in one-on-one situations after Travis Hunter, once again, after coming back from injury, was another Ironman with 13 catches, 140 yards, and two touchdowns. And he's playing this Ironman football, though we like to see it, but 
in order for this team to be successful, if he's going to be a guy on the other side, and we, as we understand your other number one recruit DB, you haven't activated him. So now Travis is needed on both ends. You can't be up 29, nothing. And then basically completely collapse. A decision has to be made. And this is not the only reason they lost the game. There are, there are a lot others, but it's just about not making the adjustments to stop this wide receiver who basically ran for 300 yards. He ran, he had 294, he had 294 yards receiving and the quarterback only threw for 396. So he's basically 80% of the, 80, 85% of the offense in terms of that. So you have to be able to make adjustments. You have to be able to, to decide when Travis should be on offense and when he should be on defense, or you just have to make a decision on what is he? We know he's an athlete, but what is he to help him get to the next level? Is he a wide receiver? Is he a DB? Because I think it's going to be unfair and we're going to watch him fall to him, possibly other injuries because there's just too much wear and tear on the body as you go throughout this season. And that's, there's, schedule now is also going to get a lot tougher usc alex now we all saw this coming for the most part and alex tip of the cap to you here you were way ahead of this a couple weeks ago you said on this podcast this team's going to get picked off and probably picked off more than once well they did and this team got exposed because as talented as they are in spots, they just rely way too much on Caleb Williams to be Superman and carry this team every week behind a battle line and a terrible defense that seems to be just almost moving in the wrong direction here. It's only one loss. I, I get it. But it's over for USC this year. Look, this team is not a contender. They have way too many issues this deep into the year. They're going to have to fix those issues next season with incoming freshmen and some transfers because th this team just has to get the defensive side of the ball fixed. We, we've been saying it every week, but it, it, it's brutal. They've got to get the O-line fixed. It, it's just the Caleb Williams show. And he ran into a team that just has a really great defense. And on top of that, USC has a brutal stretch of four ranked games over the last month. So to your point, Alex, you said they were going to get picked off more than once. I think it's safe to say they probably end up losing a couple games before this season is over. But I want to give some credit here to Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame. What a job this guy has done with this program. That defense, man, that Irish defense was lights out. I mean, really impressive stuff going up against this USC offense that, quite frankly, had moved the ball on just about everybody. Now, the wide receivers... I mean, they were just blanketed by Notre Dame. Those corners played incredible football. Uh, Caleb Williams had nowhere to go with the ball. His longest pass was only 21 yards. I mean, he could not have, he just did not have time in the pocket with that pass rush and those corners covering so well. He did not have time to make plays down the field. His ability to create something from nothing. It only goes so far against elite defenses. And quite frankly, Notre Dame has one. Yeah, absolutely. I think you said everything that needed to be said about USC. Those guys at Notre Dame, I truly feel sorry for those players because this should be an undefeated team in a team that's probably top five. We all know the mistake that was made in the Ohio State game. That was a top, I believe Ohio State was ring three at the time. That would have catapulted them. And then the Louisville loss. So those two losses, one that shouldn't have happened, and perhaps they'd lose to Louisville still or whatever, but they probably would still be a top 10 team had with the, along with this win. This would be a playoff team, a lock for the playoff, because after this USC game, they face Pitt, Clemson, Wake Forest, and then Stanford. All winnable games for them. I believe that this would have been, it probably would have been a top three team with the win over USC, with the win over Louisville, the win over Duke, and the win over Ohio State, and those are th four ranked teams in a row, the committee would have had no, they would have not been able to keep them out because of what they did on that run. So I feel sorry for that. I feel sorry for Notre Dame because I feel that this was their one shot to really be in the playoffs this current year. Perhaps other years, but this current year, I felt strongly about them, even going back to the Army game when we were high on what we saw from Sam Hartman, what could be of this Notre Dame team. The Heisman Trophy conversation, Alex, it might just be over. 
it's kind of felt a little bit wide open. There's a couple quarterbacks in the mix, but Michael Penix Jr. might just be the runaway favorite to win it all right now. He was awesome versus Oregon. I mean, he made so many big-time throws while getting peppered in the pocket by that defensive front. I mean, that Oregon defensive line was getting after him at several different points in this game. That kid is tough. I mean, you could see how much pain he was in after taking all those shots. He played through it and just kept spinning it. This game, it lived up to the hype, Alex. This was two top 10 teams, national TV game, rivals, awesome atmosphere at Husky Stadium. And if you're the Big Ten commissioner watching this game, and I'm sure he did, you've got to be so excited to be bringing these two programs into your conference next year. NFL talent all over the field, offense and defense, passionate fan bases, two of the loudest home stadiums in the country, easily the two best programs right now on the West Coast. Now look, USC is the bigger brand, and they're going to add them too, but these two programs are ahead of where USC is right now. Exciting game. I mean, what a catch by Rome Adunze. Hopefully I'm saying his name correctly from Michael Penix Jr. to put this game away. But you know what? If I'm the, I'll say one thing. If I'm the commissioner of the Pac-2 now, I am, I have to be kicking myself. No, I mean, before yesterday, you had three teams from the Pac-10, from the Pac-12 that were in the top 10. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, you know, I, I don't know how they miss how they. Well, actually, we do know how they bumbled it. But this is just amazing. And also Oregon State, who's at number twelve now. And thus you also have Utah. There's just a lot of what I don't understand. How all of a sudden you could not put this together. You could not see and get this on track to keep this together because you finally popped. And you finally, the SEC is down and you are the most exciting conference and it's all for nothing because it's all going away next year. But kudos to Michael Penix Jr. Kudos to Washington. Great game. It was all that it was, it was built up to be. And I think that the ranking is right that Oregon only dropped down one because that was obviously Washington was Washington. They were top ranked teams and that was a close game so i believe everybody is slotted where they should be out of those between those two teams all right let's wrap up college football week seven with the helmet sticker alex my helmet sticker is going to go to xavier watts the defensive back for notre dame we talked about this game and that defense but man this kid was huge in this matchup two interceptions a scoop and score seven tackles and a pass breakup, flat out awesome performance by Xavier Watts. He came up huge versus a really good USC offense and helped Notre Dame get a big time win over their rivals. One huge game to circle next week in college football. The game of the week, no doubt about it. This has playoff implications written all over it. Penn State at Ohio State. Ohio State is a four and a half point favorite at the time of this recording. This is the big noon game on Fox. And for Ohio State, man, I think this is Ohio State's chance for this 2023 team to really write their own narrative here. Now, we've been talking, and a lot of people around the nation have been talking about Ohio State around CJ Stroud and Justin Fields and what those teams were, the team that lost the previous two seasons to Michigan. They got bullied up front. That's kind of been the narrative the last couple of years for this team. They've been good, but they've gotten beat up by their rival in in Michigan. Now, they have everything in front of them right now to create their own ending here, and it starts with them beating a really good Penn State team. This is a big-time platform for them right now to really make that statement and let everybody know that this is a different Ohio State team. And Penn State, on the other hand, is trying to break into, into that discussion of the best team in the Big Ten and not be looked at as that third best behind Michigan Ohio, and Ohio State. What are you looking for in this matchup, Alex? I'm looking for Penn State to dominate, and I think they will. I think Penn State is on a mission I think they have something to say. And going to that house, James Franklin is going to have that team ready to play. And I think they're going to be more physical than Ohio State, which I think is a more finesse team, which is why we 
Well, why I didn't necessarily believe in them going far this year, I think they're going to get this team is going to come in and be more physical. And I don't think they're ready for it. I think Penn State is going to come here and and just wear them down. I'm not saying it's going to be a blowout or anything like that, but I expect James Franklin and Penn State to go in there and take care of business. Alex, I think you hit that one out of the park because I am thinking the same thing here. I think it's going to be a battle of physicality, especially when Penn State has the football. Penn State, 55% of the time, are running the football. They're kind of a throwback type of team for 2023. Katron Allen is a guy who runs downhill with bad intentions. I love this guy's running style. Nick Singleton is one of the best running backs in the nation. This is a tough one-two combo at the running back position. And what they have up front, I think, is going to give Ohio State problems. That offensive line might be the secret sauce for this entire team. I think Penn State is going to be able to control the line of scrimmage, shorten the game, and upset Ohio State. So, Brad, I know we're the big game next week, Penn State versus Ohio State, but I also want to point out, we just talked about it, Utah versus USC. Utah going to USC. This could be the beginning of the of, of USC going down because Utah, a very physical team. I know they're playing. They're, they have this influx at the quarterback position. However, Utah is very physical. They're very big up front on the offensive and defensive line. And because USC is weak on their offensive line as well as on their defensive line i think that utah can really make this a phone booth fight and i don't think usc wants to slug it out with utah so that's a game that i'm looking at as well and also i'm watching number 16 duke versus number four florida state not because i think duke has this great chance but i think riley leonard has now put himself on the map and obviously not as one of the top tier quarterbacks, but I think this could be a statement, win or lose, that he can show against the number four team in the country to show that he should be pushed into the top tier of quarterbacks, and then perhaps maybe even giving Duke an opportunity to win, which is unlikely. However, if a quarterback can get hot, as we saw as they did, even though Clemson kind of self-destructed and had a lot of self-inflicted wounds, but if you can do some things, you can make this game interesting, but I believe Florida State will win because those receivers are just simply too tall and too physical for what Duke has on defense. Alex, that Utah-USC game, I, I think that's a matchup to circle as well because you're right. This Utah team has really had USC's number. They beat them twice last year, once in the regular season, and then beat them again in the Pac-12 championship game. They've had their number, and you're right, it starts – with that defense and Kyle Whittingham in that hard-nosed style of football that they like to play in a phone booth, like you said, and that is not what USC likes to do. I think it's a really fascinating matchup to watch. Duke-Florida State, that's a sneaky good game too. I have been so impressed with Mike Elko and the job that he is doing at Duke. They're having a really nice season and really overachieving in a lot of ways with the talent level that they have. This is a well-coached football team that plays some really good football. I'm with you. I like Riley Leonard. I love what I've seen from him this year. And this might be just a sneaky upset alert here if Florida State doesn't come out and play their A game. Florida State's the better team, the more talented team. We know that. But this Duke team is going to be fired up for this matchup. And like I said, they're well-coached. And this is a game that you're definitely going to want to tune into. And as far as Mike Elko, circle that name because he's going to be getting some big-time job offers this offseason. Let's wrap it up with our betting locks of the week. Look, guys, last week, I'm not going to lie, it, it was ugly. And we're having trouble getting on the same page here, Alex, as far as one of us wins, one of us loses. But last week, we really didn't do very well. I had Oklahoma State. Plus three and a half. Alex, you took the Titans plus four. We threw in some bonus picks. Uh, Alex, you had Eagles minus seven. I had Tampa Bay plus three. They didn't cover. Arizona plus seven. They didn't cover. Not a good week, guys. Sorry. Let's get back on track, Alex. Let's get some winners this week. Who's going to be your lock of the week this week, Alex? 
Well, everyone, it's finally going to happen. I am going to take the Raiders going to the Bears and lay the three points that they will beat the Bears. And yes, Justin Fields is more than likely not going to play. Also, Jimmy Garoppolo is not looking like he is going to play either. So I don't even know who our starting quarterback, well, rather the Raiders starting quarterback will be, whether it's Aiden O'Connell or Brian Hoyer. But I'm confident enough with what that Raiders defense has been doing. They will be able to win this game from a fantasy note and maybe a prop bet note. Look for Josh Jacobs to get on track for this to be a get right game for him. So take the Raiders later three points, Raiders over the Bears and prop bet Josh Jacobs to get right 100 total yards and maybe a TD or maybe one to two TDs as well. My lock of the week is I'm going to take the Philadelphia Eagles minus two and a half versus the Miami Dolphins. Miami's defense is bad. And look, they've they've been getting away with having a bad defense versus teams like Carolina last week. But this Eagles team is getting a little bit undervalued as far as the betting market after that loss to the Jets. I would have expected them to be a bigger favorite in this game. Just a small two and a half point favorite, I think, is good value. And I think it's a great time to bet this team. Tua is not the same quarterback when he's under pressure. And Philly has a big advantage up front. They should be able to get after Tua, put a lot of pressure on him. And I think Philly wins and covers this game easily. That is going to do it for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it, PGF Nation. I'm Brad Fowler. He's Alex Higdon. This is Pint Glass Football, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at PGF Podcast.